the EU need, uh, need a fresh start. And I would say that a fresh start for the European Union is, uh, uh, w could be uh, one, of, one of our motto, one of the words uh, with, uh, with which we would like uh, to define our job, certainly with the world with which we define our job, but we would like also to see this world, uh, uh, the world to define the new, the new start in the new political cycle of the European Union. And this is the first main uh, point which I, I would like to, to make. We do not feel uh, our semester is a transition semester, certainly cannot be a transition semester in terms of policies can be a transition semester in terms of institution. We haven't chosen the, cal the, the calendar, but it cannot be a, a transition semester in terms of, of uh, policies. And, uh, and so far, so good, I would say, because uh, we have been saying since the very beginning of the Renzi government that uh, in view of our semester, we should have focused on uh, policy priorities and that uh, this semester should be considered not uh, as a transition, but as the first six months of five years of renewal. And certainly this is what the message we, with which we presented ourselves before the European, the Italian voters during the European elections. Uh, you know the result. And certainly now we are even more convinced after the result we got. After all, we are the party and the government who won the most in Europe during the European elections. Uh, now we are more convinced that that's the right approach, and we are very pleased that uh, this approach, uh, which uh, is emerging uh, as a common approach, because uh, you know better than me that the President of the European Council, Baron Boy, is working on a strategy document, which uh, must identify the new policy priorities around which we have to decide our common work, and around we have to decide also, uh, the, we have to take the decisions which are expected ahead of us uh, and at the European summit. So we, we think that uh, we have always thought that this was the right method and uh, we are pleased that now this method is, uh, is shared and of course we are, we are very busy and very, and very interested now in, uh, in uh, working uh, with the, the other leaders and working with the, with the president of the council around the content of this, uh, of this strategy papers and of, of these uh, strategic priorities. And, uh, and certainly uh, we, we, we think, but I mean, I would say that we feel uh, that uh, also this is progressively shared uh, in the light of our bilateral uh, meeting that the prime minister is having and, and myself, I'm having, I'm just back, I'm just back, I'm just coming. Uh, well, I have lived in Brussels for 10 years, so I mean, sometimes when I say to Brussels, I'm back. Uh, uh, I'm just arriving from Paris, where we, we had a, a, very, a very good meeting. Uh, I had a very good meeting with the Prime Minister and uh, with my counterpart, Alain Desir, and we see that uh, our, 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 our feeling and our, and our concern are are also shared. We think that in Europe there is a, wise, a widespread and still unanswered demand, uh, demand for change. And we think that uh, an absolute majority of European voters asked for this change uh, during the European elections. Then within this uh, absolute majority of voters who ask for change, you find voters who have given their confidence to forces uh, which uh, think that we must uh, 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 redouble our commitment to the European idea. We, we must redouble our commitment to the European Union, but we must change its policies. You have also voters who are given their confidence uh, to forces which think that we should get out of the European Union or we should uh, um, even uh, renounce to the European Union or we should get out of the monetary union. Uh, thanks, uh, fortunately, these uh, voters uh, and these forces uh, are not uh, enough uh, in the European Parliament to block the activity of the European Parliament and to block the activity, activity of the EU institutions. We think their votes are too many uh, uh, to not be listened to. And this is certainly, certainly another additional reason why we think that we have, uh, we have to rethink uh, our, our, common, our common work. And, uh, this means that uh, the economic, uh, a good part of the economic vision and of the economic action of the European Union, Union should, uh, should, be, 
should, should change. I mean, the time has come to rethink uh, with a fresh mind what are the most effective ways of implementing our common rules and policies, notably in the economic sector, to restore growth, create jobs, and promote, uh, promote cohesion. Uh, and this is, uh, in our view, uh, necessary because re recovery remains weak and uneven. There is still a risk uh, of uh, even more divergence across the member states, uh, and uh, also because fiscal consolidation is still challenging in spite of unprecedented efforts because uh, of subdued growth and because of very low inflation. This is the, uh, the situation, in, uh, notably in the Eurozone, but in general in the EU. And uh, we, are, uh, we are at a crossroad. We are at a crossroad between accepting a dangerous long period of fragile growth with high um, unemployment and boosting, boosting macroeconomic prospects. And uh, we think that a new European policy response is absolutely urgent. Um, certainly, uh, this, needs, uh, this means uh, to implement uh, in a, a more friendly way to growth uh, uh, our uh, common rule and policies, notably in the macroeconomic, macroeconomic sectors, means uh, to uh, uh, foster the current initiative uh, uh, in favor of uh, youth employment, but also to, to think together which kind of new policies and new initiative, concrete initiative, can be taken at European level in parallel to the necessary effort which every government must do at a national level to uh, boost employment, which kind of concrete initiative can we take in the today and in the new political cycle in the five years ahead of us uh, uh, to fight against un unemployment and notably, not only, but notably to fight against the youth, uh, youth unemployment. This means also to identify and to uh, strengthen uh, our effort to, uh, er uh, to reach new policy priorities, which are in our view essential in the economic dimension, which are the, single, uh, the digital single market, the digital agenda, and uh, the energy policy. We think that energy must be one of the highest priorities for the Union uh, for several reasons, for, because it is linked to growth, because we must uh, uh, increase our energy in independence and the European Union, because of geopolitical reasons, and because also this means uh, to work uh, for that, those uh, interconnections, those infrastructure which are absolutely needed but which are still lacking in the EU and from which also there is a, for which there is also a need for new investment and new investment policies that means to find the necessary resources at European level for the investment necessary to reach, to reach this goal. So uh, the digital agenda and the energy are certainly to a high priorities in our, in our view. We, we need, uh, as I, was, I had mentioned already in my introduction, we need to encourage national structural reforms when they are serious, when they are credible, when, as they are already, are under common surveillance. We, all, we are uh, now in a, uh, I would say in a, in a house of, of glass, I mean, in a, very, uh, in a very transparent house. Everybody, each government can know and knows perfectly what is being done by other government in the national structural reform. But uh, we need policies uh, which uh, are at the service of growth and uh, which accompany, accompany the national structural reform when they are uh, there and when it is clear to everybody that even if they are costly in the short run, they bring structural and substantial benefit in terms of growth in the medium run. And it is clear that this means also that we have uh, to uh, consider uh, the uh, national economic situation, looking also at the inter interdependence that they, they exist between the different national economies. And also to the positive effect, to the positive spillover that the national structural reforms might have on the Eurozone, on the uh, single market, on other economies when they are serious. So that means also to evaluate uh, the country situation not only uh, 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 in parallel looking all, only at the, at the national dimension, but starting to see also what are the uh, interaction 
and what are also the positive interaction which can be raised by the single national structural reform, which each country must do anyhow, not because uh, we have committed to do so at European level, not because it is written in our rules, because it is in, in the interest of our citizens. In the case of friendly government, certainly in the interest of, uh, of, um, of Italians, of, Ita of Italian citizens. Uh, we also want uh, to uh, put uh, the real economy at the center of uh, the new European action. So in the limit of the competence of the European Union, we think that uh, industry policy, industrial relaunch, the industrial relaunch of uh, uh, manufacturing industries in the, in the EU uh, to spell out and to better and uh, clearly identify also the roadmap of the industry policy, which was identified, and it, we think that it is a first good starting basis, but there are m other things that can be done. The, the agenda which was agreed at the European Council in March around the so-called industrial renaissance must be certainly spelled out, and we have to identify a clear roadmap to reach uh, those goals we have, uh, we have, uh, we have identified. Uh, there is uh, uh, another issue that uh, we want to put on the table. We know that uh, it is not an issue that can be uh, solved, uh, tackled, uh, discussed, uh, and decided uh, during our semester, but it is an issue, a matter for, for discussion and for common work during the new legislature in the years to come, but we have to start the discussion now. It is, uh, uh, it is the need uh, to find new resources to finance growth. And uh, because there is a dramatic fall in both private and public investment, and because uh, we uh, need uh, to see uh, how we can fill the gap between the current uh, resources, which are at disposal at European level, uh, look, uh, looking at the multi-annual uh, financial framework, the, and the objective that we have to reach. We want to reach a, a, com, a, a, a digital single market. We want to reach a, a truly European common policies. We want to reach those EU 2020 targets. By the way, we will launch the consultation in view of the review of the EU 2020 in, in uh, March 2015. During our semester, we will launch the consultation to prepare the review of this uh, EU 2020 strategy. If you look at the common objective that we have already decided, and at the objective that we want to add, uh, and we will see what will be the outcome of the next European Council in Ypres and Brussels next week. And you look at the resources we are, uh, we are, there are at disposal of the EU today, you see that you, we must find the way of uh, finding new resources for a new European investment policies. That, uh, in our view, can be done looking at uh, a more dynamic uh, role of the European Investment Bank as first, but can also be done in developing those uh, embryo ideas around, which has been floating around in, uh, in Brussels around the project bonds and about the possible new European instrument, a new European fund uh, financed through the project bonds uh, at the service uh, of those uh, new common objectives which I, I, I have uh, I, have told, I, I, I have told, told, told you about uh, before that uh, it is uh, the first one in asking the European Investment Bank to play a more dynamic role, it's for the short run. The second is food for thought during, us, during our semester, and the matter notably and not only for the new uh, European Commission, the new president of the Commission, but something that must be discussed between Council, Commission and Parliament uh, uh, immediately in, in order to have this uh, to find this new instrument during, uh, during, our, during our, uh, our legislature. Certainly, we want to pursue uh, that uh, agenda which was identified and uh, only partially implemented because of the difficulty of this uh, debate and negotiation within the Council uh, of the report of the four presidents, the, 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 the report uh, toward the genuine economic and monetary union. There are various parts which have been, uh, uh, haven't been uh, implemented, as you know, I uh, in the economic union, in the political union. And that's certainly something that needs uh, to be, to be t taken on and uh, to, 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 be, to, to, be, to be pursued. That is, uh, uh, in the, I would say, the highlights. I don't know, I, I have two minutes more? Huh? That these are, are the highlights and, uh, of uh, our our economic priorities, and I think that uh, in this, uh, in this uh, institution you are much more interested in the economic dimension. But let me conclude 
and this is not last but not least, I will say that, uh, I mean, these are the main priority for us, that, I mean, uh, uh, beyond the need to change European discourse, uh, we need also to uh, put at the center of the European Union action and of the European Union message we give to our citizens the issue of uh, democratic principle and of, of fundamental rights. In, 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 any, in any presentation, I start from this. It is only <laughs> because, uh, because you are much more interested in the well, other aspect. Even as economists, <laughs> we are interested in democracy. In the other aspect that, uh, that uh, I, haven't, I haven't take too much of your time, but certainly we think that uh, we need uh, to uh, get out of this risk of double standard according to which we do the screening, the word we use in Brussels, to members, to, to candidates when they, are, they want to join the European Union, and then once the, these uh, candidate countries are member state of the Union, this, their national situation is a black, blo black box, and we actually do not have the real mean to really ensure that there is also a dialogue, a discussion, a negotiation on the respect of fundamental rights, because Europe is for and foremost a Europe of fundamental values, a union of fundamental values, and only at the second stage, a Europe of e financial parameters. We are very uh, demanding in terms of financial parameters with our citizens. We are much less demanding in terms of respect to democratic principles and fundamental rights. And we think that we should reverse at least to complete uh, this approach. And last point, uh, certainly, in our view, the enlargement to uh, Western Balkans, Serbia, Albania are priorities to our, during our semester. We want to take some step ahead on the negotiation with both uh, uh, there. Uh, just uh, to, to mention, transatlantic trade and investment partnership for us is a priority. We know that the negotiations are difficult, but we will do what we can to uh, move, ahead, uh, move ahead there. And, uh, but uh, that requires another seminar, uh, the lack of a true European policy on immigration and asylum. I want to take three hours of your time telling you why we are running a huge risk with the absence of Europe in the Mediterranean and why this is the best fuel in the engine of the xenoph xenophobic, eurosceptical parties and forces in you around Europe. The absence of a truly European common approach in immigration and asylum is something that we have already paid in terms of political cost very high and we will continue to pay if the situation continues like that. But if, I mean, if the draft conclusion of the European Council, which I, I've seen, are confirmed, there is some, some yet it moves. Right. Something is moving there. Thank you very much. Uh, I find it particularly interesting that Italy is taking over now um, uh, on uh, the Council level because uh, I mean, you really have your work cut out for you. Uh, I mean, as a journalist, it's much easier. You just have, I just have to travel to Italy to cover it, which is definitely the better task. But uh, in, in, in terms of what, what is going on right now, I think what we've seen over the past weeks was a very interesting experiment in many ways, because after that, at least to some people, mind-bogglingly boring uh, election campaign, we saw a real emergence after uh, election day where people really be began to tune in, and I think that is a real progress. Um, we saw it particularly in Germany, uh, which we, of course, cover primarily because we had a German Spitzenkandidat, as you might remember, uh, Martin Schulz, uh, who uh, now, actually today, uh, about a month after the election, about a month after everybody else had found out, also realized that he's not going to become an EU commissioner. <laughs> but uh, uh, in any case, um, we uh, had an interesting campaign at home, and it, it shows, to a certain extent, um, both the advantages and the flaws of that process, because I think people tuned in more. Uh, definitely, and they paid more attention to what is going on on the European level after Election Day. However, of course, it's still driven by domestic considerations. In this case, I mean, just to give you a little insight into complicated German politics, it was clear that uh, Schulz, who was a candidate for the uh, Social Democrats, uh, lost to Juncker also in Germany, but then it was a condition of him, or of his party officially at least, that he would get a seat in the Commission. Now that they have um, uh, given up on that, I think it's much more likely that uh, 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 Merkel will fully, uh, finally, fully back Juncker and will push him 
to become uh, commission president. However, um, what is interesting now is that, and that really plays into what uh, Sandro was saying here, uh, it's not just going to be about personalities. I mean, the next summit next week is going to be equally uh, much about content and about uh, the future direction of the European Union. We see this interesting emergence of two camps really in Europe. Uh, we saw this, uh, you all remember the picture of the four people in the boat in Sweden. Uh, um, with, uh, with uh, unfortunate Merkel wasn't rowing. I think it was the Swedish prime minister who was rowing, but still uh, she was more or less calling the shots. And, but what they agreed on was a new agenda in a way for Europe that could be uh, a compromise to appease the uh, people that are opposed to the person of Juncker. I mean, that you, and, and you pointed that out. I mean, actually your remarks in many ways were very similar to what they were asking for. More uh, free market, more uh, um, internal, uh, uh, internal and external uh, free trade, a, a stronger digital agenda, and finally a, a focus on growth. But then on the other hand, of course, you have a group of people, I think, invited tomorrow to Paris, of uh, seven heads of government plus Schulz and Gabriel from, from Germany uh, that want to come together to agree on a slightly different agenda. And um, I, I don't want to pepper you with questions while I'm making my comments, but I, I would find it interesting to uh, find out more about your uh, differences from the Swedish group. What you would say maybe later in, in the Q&As, what, what are the two different visions that these groups uh, uh, have have for Europe because I think that is uh, that is the crucial question right now. Um, we have had this long discussion in in, in, in Germany at least because Gabriel, our uh, Minister of Economics and Vice Chancellor, triggered that debate about a potential easing of the stability pact, uh, and he gained at least some support from France and Italy on that matter. So that was a little reminiscent of the debates about ten years ago. Um, when we had very similar uh, discussions, which ultimately led to the first violation of that pact by, by France and Germany. Um, so uh, even though the Germans rejected that idea um, pretty strongly, I think there is some sympathy even in the German government to at least entertain that idea, this uh, realization that uh, it is difficult uh, in this time to introduce uh, to introduce serious reforms while you're so f uh, constrained by some of these criteria of the stability pact. I think this sentiment is growing. It's not publicly uttered, as you have seen in the debates, but if you talk to people behind the scenes, there is more of a sentiment, and that has partly to do also with the Italian government, because from what I hear, um, it is a crucial imperative uh, in Berlin, but also in other member states, to reach out to Renzi, to reach out also to France, because they realize that there is no point in humiliating France at this point and not making it part of this uh, reform process. And I think that is the very delicate question now. I mean, our Chancellor Merkel always prides herself on being described as a master t strategist at European summits, but now it's a really delicate task because on the one hand, she has to keep literally the Brits and others in the boat, uh, but at the same time, um, she cannot give away too much because otherwise she's gonna alienate other parts of Europe, uh, including, I, I fear, Italy and France if she uh, subscribes too much to that agenda that is uh, being pushed, particularly, particularly by uh, by the by the Brits. Um, what I see as a problem in that whole process is that um, I think you we all agree that structural reforms are needed, particularly in countries like Italy and and France. I think the problem is that with the uh, uh, agenda set by the stability pact, you have that problem that is always seen as something that is imposed by Brussels. I mean, uh, Hollande was very outspoken in that regard, saying very clearly, well, uh, it's pushed on us by, by Brussels. So I think if you want to come around, if you want more structural reforms, you have to do it in a, <coughs> in a slightly uh, more subtle way. And, and I think actually the look at the German reform debates helps because it's often mentioned now by people in Germany that we had the agenda 2010 reforms and they helped us. So, so the bottom line in, in Germany is often, well, why don't they just introduce the reforms that we have pushed for successfully? And if they don't do that, it's their, it's their own fault. I think 
um, that's too easy because um, if you look more closely, for example, at the Agenda 2010 reforms, it was largely, the success was largely due to um, the good relationship between employers and employees in Germany that has grown over decades that facilitated it to introduce these reforms and to introduce wage cuts. So that is again then a structural reform. You would need that in these countries and you would need more, uh, more of that and that can not just be pushed by Brussels. And one last thought, um, what I hear from the Commission side is that they are a little concerned about the run up to the summit because if you uh, basically, then select a commission president, be it Juncker or be it the white knight that might still emerge. Uh, and if he's basically boxed in by policy imperatives that are already agreed on, that undermines, of course, the uh, institutional uh, structure a little bit. And that was always different. I mean, we've talked about EU 2020. That was something that Barroso presented to the council and the parliament, but these were his own guidelines. So I think we have to be a little delicate or act a little delicately in that institutional struggle as well.